Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 106, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. After a pretty manic week, I think it's fair to say. Oh yeah, well, I was I was DJing on the Friday night and then we were doing a panel in the morning, so I had to kind of deal with that hangover and <laughs> we got in and <laughs> talked to them, but... It, what a panel it was. Now, this was all your bass festival in Nottingham. Uh, we were there on the Saturday morning, and despite the fact that it was a grey, wet, cold January morning, still a good turnout, though, I think. Yeah, when we turned up, we had the kind of tropical sounds of David Wise doing the uh, Donkey Kong <laughs> Destructed. Yeah, Deconstructed. It was great. And then after that, we did a little panel. It was, I mean, this festival was all about music, and it was yeah. the first one they've done. Um, we were there. We actually did a live recording of the Retro Hour podcast with that Rob Hubbard. Oh, my God, yeah. Graham Norgate. Yeah, David Wise. He came oh. in and joined us halfway through as well. So, essentially, we got to sit down with these three legends and just talk about video game music. And they're all from different time periods as well because you've got, like, David Wise doing Donkey Kong Country. You've got Graham doing... Um, Killer Instinct. And Golden then, Eye. Yeah, yeah. And then you've got Rob doing all the really early stuff, the C64 and all that. So it's a great range of guests. And we're actually going to be um, putting that as our interview next week. Yeah, absolutely. And Graham actually says in it that, you know, Rob was kind of his inspiration. Yeah. So that was like kind of, you know, wow. great to get them all together. So uh, if you are a fan of video game music from all generations, I mean, that's the thing about this show. I mean, we do kind of say in this panel, we kind of cover everything from like the ZX81 up mm. to the PlayStation 2. Yeah. And audio developed so much. I mean, you know, the ZX81 didn't have any audio. The changes were so fast. You know, even David Wise was saying, oh, we were excited that we got MIDI. Yeah. <laughs> it was like years later. When, yeah. yeah, so definitely look out for that on next week's show. We'll bring you that panel that we recorded live at All Your Bass Festival. And, of course, there's something else rather big on the calendar coming up next month. Oh, yeah, we've got Play Expo coming up. And, oh, my God, the YouTubers panel, the DMA panel, oh, the Spectrum panel. This is just going to be amazing. You know, this will be our fourth Play Expo, and I think this is, the lineup is probably my favourite yet. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's going to be great. Like, I, I'd turn up and watch these people if I wasn't on the stage. Absolutely. Now. now, we are going to be doing, I mean, we're still sorting out the days. They should be confirmed any day now, uh, what's going to be happening. <laughs> you just spill your tea everywhere. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Cleaner frowning through the window, <laughs> are you? Uh, but we are going to confirm what's going to be happening on each day of the weekend. YouTubers looking like it's going to be the Sunday. Yeah. And we have a new announcement to make. Now, we already told you that Guru Larry's going to be there. Slopes. Nos- yeah, Slopes Game Room, Nostalgia Nerd. Oh, Kim Justice. Who are all, you know, our favourite YouTubers. But we are, please, we're going to have to put an extra seat on the end of our table uh, because Stuart Ashen is going to be joining us too. Oh my God, how are we going to fit everybody on stage? This is going to be epic. <laughs> have to be some kind of like, you know, musical chairs. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how many YouTube videos are going to get produced of the YouTubers. That yeah. should be interesting. <laughs> well, it's going to be, you know, we're going to sit down for an hour with them. And obviously, Stuart, he does video game books, you know, the terrible old game books that he does. And yeah. um, I'm sure there's going to be some of them on sale there as well. But I even love his videos where he just picks up random crap from like Poundland and talks about them, that kind of thing. Well, one thing about Play Expo is that we always used to see a wonderful guy there and it was Bob Wakelin. Yeah. And we always used to go there and kind of bump into Bob and he'd have all these things and, you know, he was going through leukemia at the time so he had all these scars from his operation and kind of stuff but, you know, he'd still be out there, he'd still see the retro community and we were lucky enough to have him on the podcast. We're sad to say that he's died and passed away uh, this week mm-hmm. so uh, you know we send our condolences to his family and he's just such an incredible influence the amount of people he influenced to get that game and to get involved with the whole gaming world you know a lot of it's down to Bob well he was you know the some of the most iconic cover art of the 80s really you know Ocean Software stuff like Contra Batman Operation Wolf yeah yeah just some fabulous pieces of art and you know he's such a nice guy if you listen back to our interview, he's so funny. Yeah. And he's just marvellous. So, Especially when you say, you know, in private, he was going through this really tough time, obviously, his awful illness. But he still had a smile on his face. He was still chipper. He still loved talking to his fans and meeting them. Yeah, he'd even, you know, post about how he was going through, like, surgery and yeah. uh, therapy and everything. And he'd still be, you know, ready to come to play Expo and ready to meet his fans. What a great guy. Absolutely. And his interview was hilarious as well. He's yeah. so funny, yeah. wasn't he? So he, he's, oh, uh, You're going to be missed, Bob. Yeah, Definitely. absolutely. Rest in peace, Bob. And uh, if you didn't check out that podcast, I mean, it's worth a listen this weekend. Um, we'll put that in our show notes at theretrohour.com. 
Now, we did mention about play coming up, obviously, and we're doing the DMA panel. Steve yep. Hammond is going to be joining us for that. Oh, Steve Hammond, he's absolutely amazing. He did Lemmings 2, which was one of my uh, favourite titles. Oh, no. <laughs> and he worked on, like, you know, Shadow of the Beast on the Commodore 64. Oh, yeah. Um, le- the original Lemmings, he did some stuff on that. Level design and the graphics on that, too. Hired Guns, one of my all-time favourite video games. That, that was like one of those early FPSs, wasn't it? Where you kind of, you're all in the corner and you've got to go around and shoot each other, but it, the scrolling's like... Yeah, it's yeah. yeah it's pretty much a, it's a bit like, you know, it's it's a dungeon kind of game really. Yeah. But very atmospheric and he was there at a really interesting time. He kind of left around just as around, you know, they they kind of got took over in in 97 I think it was mm-hmm. and when obviously Grand Theft Auto came out, change of fortunes of the company, and he kind of left them. Yeah. So this is going to be really interesting. Kind of a little warm-up for the panel at play, because we are going to be joined by some more guys from DMA. But to give you a little taste, Steve Hammond, the story of DMA design, is going to be our special guest on this week's episode of the Retro Hour podcast. The reason that we can keep bringing you these amazing interviews, we can get to these amazing events, is all thanks to the people who make it possible for us to keep doing the Retro Hour podcast every week, and that is people who make donations and find their place in the Hall of Fame. Now, to do this, obviously, we do say this all the time, it's not a Patreon, it's not a subscription. No, it's it's a pot that you can just shove a bit in the pot and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tip jar. Yeah, tip it, jar, that's it. Yeah. If you like it, you know, put a couple of quid in, we'll, we'll keep, you know, it helps us keep doing the show every week for you. It means that we haven't got to pay for everything ourselves. Yeah. So if you want to do that, we've got a PayPal link. Um, we would accept pretty much all Forms of cryptocurrency on the Ethereum network. Yep. Um, so you can find all those and links Bitcoin on the Bitcoin as well. It's, it's gone up. down recently. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might have some spare now yeah. kicking around. So what you got to do if you'd like to make a donation is head onto our website, theretrohour.com. Little buttons there on the front page. And uh, making the Hall of Fame this week, thank you so much for your donation. Darren Coles. Stuart Smith. Rupert Fuller. Paul Sopiak. Who all made donations into the running of the podcast. And you can do the same at theretrohour.com. Now, I'm actually at an event in London when the show comes out. I'm at the uh, the BET conference. Now, this is happening over two days at London's Excel, okay. mainly about computers and education, really. Ah, cool. So I'm down there for a couple of days. Uh, the Raspberry Pi guys are going to be down there too. Lots of stuff going on. But one thing that is actually happening today at the time this episode comes out, and hopefully I'm going to manage to get some video of this and either put it on my YouTube channel or, or Facebook or something like that. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes or on our Facebook page. And that is the launch of the Citronix Game Zip 64 Oh, the game Zip 64. Now, what's this? Now, have you seen, obviously, we talked about this on the show before, uh, the BBC micro bit. So this was the computer that was going to be given to every single school ch- child in the UK. Yeah, to learn programming on and yeah. kind of, it's, you know, the reintroduction of the computer literacy program, essentially. Well, this is really cool. It's um, a little add-on cost. Have you played with a micro bit before? Yeah, I've not played with a micro bit, but I, I'm looking at this add-on and I've played with something similar. We'll talk about it in a sec. Well, Arduino is pretty similar yeah, as well, yeah. that kind of thing, isn't it? It's basically modular, so you can add stuff via GPIO ports and that kind of stuff. But they have got a little add-on here that is, it really turns the micro bit into a very rudimentary handheld console. Yeah, so like I, I've seen this before. So they had one. Um, oh god, I can't remember what the company was. It was this really nice little unit that you build it out of an Arduino, and yep. you you kind of had this little matrix grid display on. Did the you front. have one? Yeah, but it wasn't un- based on the micro bit. It was based on the Arduino, one yeah. of the original ones. And you could program little games using Python, like Snake, or you could have it draw different images and stuff like that. But it seems to be they've made one for the uh, micro bit. Yeah, so this isn't, it's not an LCD screen or anything. It's essentially LEDs. Yeah. So, I mean, you can do games, like you said, Snake is a, is a prime example. You can probably do Tetris and that kind of stuff as well on it. Um, uh, maybe maybe Breakout or something like yeah, that. Yeah, essentially anything is block-based, I guess. You know, <laughs> maybe even someone will do Minecraft on it, you know, that's quite <laughs> cool. Uh, but you can a- essentially address all of the different, 64 of them on this board, LED display screens. They go in different colours and stuff too. Um, it's even got onboard sound as well. Oh, and it's cool. got breakout pads for doing stuff like shoulder buttons in there too. Or or you could even hook it up to really big kind of you know, LED panels. So you could, you know, for like a bar or something, you could put like a massive one on the wall. Oh, that's a good idea. Pretty cool. And they're actually going to be releasing uh, some games for free for people to download. Or, um, obviously, I think the idea of this really is for kids to kind of learn their own simple programming and make games on it, which yeah. I think is really good. So they're called Zip LEDs, the display screen, isn't there? 64 of them. Yeah. And I think this is a good idea because it's in the format that kids are going to want to get involved with a little handheld Mm. you know if you hand them a circuit board and go this is a computer they're not really going to be interested but once they've got a 
image on a screen and then you know playing along even how even if it's just simple leds they might want to get into python or start changing that image well i think you know playing games is fun but obviously when you see the power of being able to make them especially as a kid that's like really captivating i think isn't it yeah and you know you can make stuff like pong and snake and that kind of stuff on this machine it looks interesting but i was actually in maplin last week and they've got a section in our local maplin which is dedicated it's called educational um, computers yeah so they've got the raspberry pis in there the pi zero the pi three they've got the arduino in there they've got a bbc micro bit section but i don't know if you've been in there recently no not big for section ages. of the wall and they've got all the different add-ons and boards oh, and stuff cool. it's and they've got like a robot unit that you can make a, i a think kit. i may need to go back to maplins <laughs> yeah. after all these years yeah, yeah it's crazy it's like they must have about five shelves in our local maplin in town just all dedicated to these educational boards oh. and i was looking at them and i thought oh should i pick a couple up but then i thought when am i gonna have time to do it you know what i mean well, well with this it also says, you know, they run off free AA batteries. So yeah. It's not that demanding at all, is it? And it's got yeah. onboard sound as well. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I reckon it'll be cheap as well, Being coming out with the micro bit. They're, they're going to do this at a price point, aren't they? But it's them for kids, I guess, and, and maybe schools LEDs, are going to buy them. Yeah, yeah so uh, that is actually getting its launch, like I said, at London's Excel Centre, uh, probably today at the Bet Show. So uh, keep an eye out. Hopefully I can get over to them and uh, maybe get a little interview with them or some video or something. I'll spot them there. I'll yeah. try my best to get that done. Now, were you a fan of the theme park games back in the day and theme hospital? Oh, and... I did. You see, theme park was totally different to theme hospital. I yeah. Did you play theme hospital? I used to play theme park, never played theme hospital. Theme hospital was like, all the seriousness had been taken out of it. You know, theme park had a bit of a nasty kind of management thing, you know, put the salt up and get the meat and the yeah, chips yeah, yeah. and then all that kind of making money. to be money. a capitalist pig. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> theme hospital was like you had to cure really weird diseases, like a guy's head would inflate like to three times the size right. and then the doctor, you'd go in and he'd pop the head with a pin <laughs> and it was all about comedy, but it was also about how you structured your wards, how you had kept your staff happy you know that the caretaker who wasn't didn't have a nice pool table would get very angry and walk around in a mood and not bother cleaning up the place right okay <laughs> yeah so it was it was kind of like a hospital management sim but the, the whole thing about theme hospital was there wasn't a moment where you'd be sitting there and you weren't kind of doing something there'd always be like a helicopter landing with 20 people with hairy itis or there'd be like a, a mayor coming in for a visit and you had to make sure the whole place was clean and everything so okay. it's just an absolutely fantastic game and i noticed uh, that there's a game called two point hospital coming out by sega now this is essentially i mean looking at the guys who are behind this this is really the spiritual successor isn't it to well it's, 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 it's a lot of the original bullfrog team isn't it so, yeah and lionhead as well yeah, yeah. so peter molin is obviously not involved. <laughs> yeah, I don't, maybe in the background, but you might be uh, yeah, not, yeah, not, not publicly. Publicized. But this is a game that's it's available on Steam, from what I've seen. Um, yeah. That's going to be the platform they release it on. But this is Mark, Mark Webley and Gary Carr, who were involved in the original game. And they're kind of saying, you know, they've been talking about this for years, kind of going back to these Bullfrog-esque kind of route, and, you know, those kind of games and doing something similar. And... You know, they did Theme Hospital. The other ideas for loads of other games, Theme Prison, Theme Resort, apparently they were talking about doing too. But now the guys are back together and they've come out with this game, which looks, I mean, look, like I said, I've never really played Theme Hospital, but I've seen videos of it and I remember seeing it on telly yeah. and that kind of thing. It, it looks visually quite, you know, obviously an upgraded version, but quite similar. Oh, no, yeah, totally. I saw this and I was just like, I want it straight away. And there's little changes. So they've changed, like, they used to have Coke machines in there and they've changed them to Sega arcade cabinets. Right. <laughs> and there's there's little changes throughout. And there's supposed to be a whole new host of diseases as well. Okay. I think there's one where a guy's head turns into a light bulb. I wasn't quite sure what that one was. L lightheadedness. Yeah, okay. lightheadedness. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And just... Great jokes like that throughout the whole thing. And I hope they have the announcer, because they used to have an old announcer, which would just be like, ding, ding. <laughs> right, well, the three, there's a man inflating. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it does look like a big throwback to those kind of games. You know, if you, if you did love those old Bullfrog kind of sim games. Yeah. Looks like yeah. this would be great fun. You know, I'd love to play this on. They should bring this up on the Nintendo Switch. Oh, yeah. I, I bet they will. Yeah, I that, bet it's got to be done, problem. yeah. And I think this is going to be a, a very popular title if they do it well. Well, we'll put this in the show notes if you want to keep an eye on it at theretrohour.com. It's good to see kind of these old, you know, kind of genres that you don't see much of anymore making a comeback. Totally. Maybe there is a genre of games that you really miss and you'd like to make your own. Maybe for the NES. Have you heard about this project, the NES Maker? Uh, no, I've not seen it. Well, this is essentially a programming language that allows you 
to make games for the original Nintendo Entertainment System, but it doesn't involve any coding. What, does it run on the original NES as well? Yes, you can, you, if you've got like a flash cut or something, you can run it on them. Wow. So the way you do it is, it's actually all kind of visual, no coding required, and you can do st- stuff like sprite graphics on there as well, you can use text editors to create text strings for NPCs. Let me play you a little bit of the video. This is okay. amazing, right? It starts off in 1988. Man, I wish you could make a Nintendo game. Yeah, our game would be totally wicked. (laughs) (laughs) Then a DeLorean falls up outside. (laughs) Whoa! Joe! Austin! Who are you? Who are you? you? From the future! 30 years in the future! We came to bring you Nest Maker. Our tool to create brand new cartridge-based hardware playable NES games. Wouldn't that take a lot of computer programming? No, young Joe, that's the best part. We explained it all on this VHS tape. <laughs> <laughs> they go in and they actually show the demo of how it works. Now they've already got this up and running at the moment, and it is a really simple way just to make your own games. And you need to do stuff like scrolling shooters in here as well. There's going to be kind of it looks quite modular too, so you can do stuff like a platformer kind M- of mode. NPCs as well. Wow, this you could get really advanced in this. It yeah. does look pretty advanced, and they are talking. You know, there's actually a video where they go around a gaming show, and there's people like you know uh, Gamestar eighty one. Oh, cool. He's yeah, yeah. talking about like how established how uh, people commentators. Yeah, yeah, and they've already got this. Um, you know, running at the moment, but what what they want to do is essentially there's a Kickstarter running to get these produced and get them out on cartridges, and uh, you can assemble them in one click essentially when the game's done. So yeah. export it to an emulator, run it on the original. And they hardware. mentioned you can you can make the game endless. So if you had a scrolling shooter, it could just go on forever. <laughs> So it's quite authentic to the original game. Yeah. Then, yeah. That's really cool. I mean, you know, there must always be a moment where, especially for kids who grew up with like, these kind of consoles, where you thought, I'd love to be able to make my own game. But... Well, especially a Nintendo system, because yeah. they're so locked off as well, you know. You had to get like the dev kits, and you had to get your own cartridges made and all that back then. Yeah, so. yeah. The, well, the guy we had on who did Tanglewood. Yeah. <laughs> the, the madness he was telling us with all the old dev kits. So, yeah. You know. Well, even that, you know, you don't have to learn 6502 assembly and all that. You can just use this kind of, essentially your drag and drop, you know, custom games made in this kit. It looks really interesting. I think, you know, it must have took quite a bit of programming to make this. Oh, yeah, definitely. So um, the Kickstarter is up and running now. If you want to back that, again, you'll find that in this week's show notes at theretrohour.com. Something else that's kind of been made recently that I never thought I'd see is... A Spectrum laptop. Oh, yes. Well, this is the Spectrum Next, which is coming out. And uh, we all know this is a kind of continuation of the Spectrum. This yeah. is a motherboard which has many enhancements. We've seen a few different versions of the Next. Uh, many Jim Bagley show them at shows. Yeah, yeah. They, they're kind of getting smaller and smaller every year, aren't they? <laughs> the first one was really big. And then, yeah. But this guy's essentially put it into a laptop. He's put it into a laptop case, but he's kind of done it in a 1990s HP Omnibook. Okay. And uh, what he's done is he's actually designed it in CAD and sent off the designs uh, to Shapeways, which is one of these companies. They're quite cool, actually. If you haven't got a 3D printer, you can build your own 3D models and send them off and they'll print it out for you. So he's built this prototype case and he's kind of got... Um, you know, little Raspberry Pi ports in there. He's got the USB ones. It's got a battery included. No, it hasn't got a battery included, actually. I think it's just straight powered. Okay, it's quite authentic to the original. <laughs> yeah, one. yeah. I mean, it looks cool. Um, I've got to say, the one question that comes to my mind is, why go to the effort of putting the next in there when you could just put a Raspberry Pi in there and run an emulator? Yeah, true. Oh, oh. <laughs> but I guess there is, is all something about having, you know, authentic hardware. Well, um, also, I, I know, with the Next, is it coming out with a case as well? I've I've seen... I think there are going to be various cases available for it. Yeah, I've seen a few, like, of the transparent ones. Yeah. And well, again, I, you know, like I said, you could run it on an emulator, but it's not the same. No, that's the thing. It's like, I've always wanted to make an Amiga laptop, a 600 one, and I was actually thinking, if I did do the designs in... I could get them printed now. I could send them off to one of these 3D printing companies and kind of start prototyping, so... Maybe mad projects will start to come about. <laughs> More mad projects. But yeah, I think it's cool that he's done this. It's obviously, again, it's a bit of a labour of love for a, a specy fan who's always oh, wanted yeah. a specy laptop. Kind of running it on your MacBook. Not quite the same kind of no, appeal, no. really, is it, on a you know 1080p screen. So if you want to find out more about that, check this week's show notes too. Uh, while we're on the Raspberry Pi as well, this is a new kind of arcade bonnet, then, it's called. What's yeah. this, then, to make your own arcade machine? Yeah, so this is, um, you know, it's, it's often a nightmare when you're building a kind of interface for the Raspberry Pi and you don't really know what you're doing. Because um, there's the GPIO ports and then you've got to 
a lot of people made a custom board before, or they kind of had big chunky ones. This appears to be coming from Adafruit, who are these companies that do, you know, nice little cases they've done for the Raspberry Pi Zero and stuff. Yeah. Game Boy stuff. Um, and this just slots on top of the GPIOs, and then instantly you've got connections to all of your arcade buttons and your arcade stick, and then you can just mount it into anything. So it's quite a quick solution for doing it. And it's only 15 quid. 15 quid, yeah. That's yeah. it. So you can source all your buttons and everything and then hook them all up. You've got to make your own kind of cabinet unit for it then, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But you could put it in anything. You could have it in an ice cream tub. You could yeah. in, you know. <laughs> That's a true ethic of Raspberry Pi hackers, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. That's how you do it. Uh, there is actually another one as well. I mean, I've got to give a shout out to these guys, monsterjoysticks.com. They actually make, um, it's a bit more than just this, they actually make a proper kind of arcade unit for the Raspberry Pi. And they're doing stuff like, you know, you can run SNES emulators in there as well. Um, they've actually done one, the reason they sent it to me is, you know, my video I did on um, Amibian? Yeah. yeah. For the, which is an Amiga emulator for the Raspberry Pi. They actually, um, they've got some of the drivers running on the Amiga now as well. So they've actually sent me this kit, which I haven't had time to assemble yet. Uh, but, it looks a bit similar to this, but it's it's a bit more fully featured. You get the actual unit to mount it inside and everything as well. Um, but again, it's proper arcade quality buttons and joystick and all that. Included That's with it. it. It's, it's like, you know, the feel of proper micro switches and everything. And oh, it's just good. <laughs> yeah. And that was always what you wanted to own as a kid, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think these are really cool. And anything you can do with the Raspberry Pi just interests me. You know, I've got three Raspberry Pis now. I'm just doing nothing. And I like, need to find something to do with them, Dan. That's it. So many. If you ever go on forums and that, I was like, so what are you doing with your Raspberry Pis? And I was like, oh, I used to run coding on it for a bit. And uh, I've got a few yeah, ideas. Yeah, I, I had a little <laughs> cloud server that I've now chucked away. Yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah. <laughs> But there is so much potential for them, and I think, you know, this kind of stuff, just being able to have a little portable arcade unit that you can take around anyone's house and hook it up via HDMI is pretty cool in itself, I think, isn't it? Totally. All right, guys, well, thank you for checking out episode number 106 of the Retro Hour podcast. We'll be out again next Friday, bringing you that music panel that we recorded with some absolute legends at all your bass festivals, so definitely worth checking out next week's show for that. Really good one, actually, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, there's some really funny stories from Rob, actually. <laughs> yeah, there's always funny stories from Rob. True. So that's coming up <laughs> on next week's show. And now, to give you a little bit of a warm-up for our DMA panel that is going to be happening next month in Blackpool at Play Expo, which, uh, if you want to book tickets for, I'd be quick, because it's not far away now. And we've got the links to book your tickets on our website, theretrohour.com, as well. And here he is, the story of DMA design. Our special guest this week is Steve Hammond. I'll see you next week. Ciao. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time to welcome this week's very special guest. And we are honoured, you know, being massive fans of DMA design games. Um, we can't wait to get some stories from, you know, backstage and what was going on back in the day. Welcome to the show. Steve Hammond. Hello, I'm happy to be here. Now, it's really cool that we've got you on because obviously you're, you're going to be on our uh, DMA design panel that we're going to be doing at Play Expo yeah. in Blackpool next month. I mean, do, do you do many of those kind of panels or will this be a bit of a first? Um, it's kind of a first. Uh, I've been on a panel with some other fan filmmakers at Edinburgh Comic Con uh, two years now. Mm. It's a, a very different thing because I'm up there, you know, with uh, two of my friends. Whereas this, um, it'll be the first time it'll just be myself. Well, we thought if we did this chat with you today, we don't need to do any research then, you know, for the panel. So, you know, you'll do it all for us. <laughs> Saves us questions, yeah. <laughs> so let's, I mean, talk a bit about your history, going all the way back to day one. I mean, this is kind of a question we always like to ask, just to yeah. get, get a bit of yeah. background. Um, what's kind of your earliest gaming or computer memory then? What's the first thing you can kind of remember? The first game I ever played was Moon Buggy on the VIC-20. Mm. And also, my first computer was a VIC-20, and that would have been 1983. At that time, you know, it, it was only a few people in school that also had computers, and they were all spectrums, mainly. You know, no, no one else had a VIC-20. But we found out uh, that there was a, a computer club on Thursday evenings, and this was at the, the Kingsway Amateur, uh, sorry, you know, at the uh, Kingsway College, and this was called the Kingsway Amateur Computer Club. So we went along and... Wow, there are dozens of people with dozens of computers. So, you know, th this is where I met uh, Mike Daly and Dave Jones and Russell Kay. And, you know, we got talking. It was it was a hobbyist venue, really, you know. It just, you had a computer, you came along and uh, showed it off. And some of us, you know, playing games, obviously, and it was a lot of game playing. Some of us, you know, kind of liked the idea of writing games mm. as well. So, you know, Mike, you know, was certainly, you know, well into experimenting writing games uh, Russell I think had already 
been halfway through a project. So we just kind of, uh, I don't know, naturally got together at, you know, coffee breaks, you know, halfway through the evening and talked about making games rather than just playing games. So how did you get hold of your Vic-20 then? Did you have to do some um, convincing to your parents? Or? Oh, it, hel- it would help with my homework, of course. It <laughs> was, everybody said that, didn't they? But, you know, really, it was uh, <laughs> just please, 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 please. And, you know, that Christmas, uh, I got a Vic-20. I yep. don't know whether it was the, the games that actually attracted me to it in the first place. I was looking at them and I thought, I like that keyboard. You know, a nice big clicky, chunky keyboard. I mean, you could, you think of other systems that were out about the same time, like the ZX80 and the Spectrum and stuff, and like their keyboards were, you know, like you said, the Vic probably did have the best keyboard on the, the market that was affordable. Uh, the, the only other comparable one was the, the Texas Instruments, uh, was it the 1994A? Mm. And it was expensive. I mean, it was massively expensive, even you know, compared to the you know, to the Vic. I mean, talking about, you know, you getting into games, I mean, was it true that you wanted to be an artist at first? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, even... Before computers, uh, uh, my first love, or genre love, I guess you'd call it nowadays, was 2000 AD. You know, Judge Dredd and uh, Sam Slade, Robo Hunter, and all that sort of thing. And, yeah, it, it never occurred to me to be a writer then, because, you know, comics were very visual. So it's like I wanted to draw. But over the years, I somehow managed to convince myself that I couldn't draw people. I think that was one of my big regrets, that I hadn't persisted and just practiced and practiced and practiced because you know at that time i was like well if i can't do it immediately i can't do it well that kind of whole scene in the like end of the 70s with judge dread and you know the kind of well end of the 80s actually wasn't it It was early 70s to 80s yeah, it's yeah. like really kind of built that cyberpunk image and that kind of a uh, british humor as well into the stuff it was a very British thing. When you go to a Comic Con these days, it uh, is Marvel and DC and Star Wars, a bit of Star Trek, tiny bit of Doctor Who, and, and maybe one booth for 2000 AD. And what I loved about those days was it was so British. British games, British comics, it, it had a feel to it. It had a, uh, oh, I, I, I don't know, it just, nobody else could have done that. Yeah, it's you know, like the Spectrum you know, games. Satire. Like, the Spectrum games felt similar to 2000 AD stuff, and it all it's, felt in yeah, the same world, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Tell us how you got into the games industry then. It was Dave. Well, I mean, obviously it was Dave Jones, you know, with uh, DMA, but he, it was well known, you know, he got paid off from Timex uh, and used his redundancy money to buy an Amiga, started coding up a game. He, he quit his uh, course. So while that was in progress, he managed to get a deal with Psygnosis to publish that, but also to get a deal to convert some other titles, some other existing Amiga titles, um, Ballistics and then Shadow of the Beast. I don't know, maybe I was just uh, you know close at hand you know, for doing graphics, but you needed somebody to convert the graphics for this port, you know, take all these lovely Amiga 32 colour graphics and someone had to turn it into a, a four colour character set for the Commodore 64 and that was me because I mean Shadow of the Beast I remember that was quite graphically it was quite a stunning game and obviously kind of downporting that to the Commodore 64 was that quite a challenge not as much of a challenge as you'd think um the advantage with that compared to a normal Commodore 64 game was it was on a floppy disk instead of just a tape so there was more capacity there and also it came out on a cartridge the scrolling as well in Shadow of the Beast yeah. was really nice. I, I, I was watching it earlier and it was just like, oh, wow, that's on the C64. Was there any <laughs> special techniques used to achieve that? I mean, the Commodore 64 was great at scrolling anyway. That was all built into the hardware. It was it was really... Well, I'll tell you, the, the technique you know, for compressing these graphics down is that every character had to do double duty as part of a graphic. Like a particular cart could be part of a tree, it could be part of something else that was green. It was kind of finding the right mix of chunks to build up these fancy graphics. And you kind of did some, you know, changes to the Commodore 64 version. You put, you were responsible for putting like the kind of text stories in there and yes, I heard that yes, inspired you to be, get um, into writing, did it? That was the, the first time I had done writing for a game. It was uh, one day, I, I, I would regularly uh, cycle down to the programmer's house saying, yeah, this is uh, well, about five miles from where I lived and you're hand over the, the latest graphics or the cassette and the, where we were transferred you know we'd talk about things and, and then he would uh, demonstrate the progress of the game so far so played it through got to the end of the level 
and then the floppy disk went, you know, where, 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 kept on going, you know, loading up the next uh, level. It's like, there's a big gap and there's nothing on the screen. So I said, you know, I could write some text, you know, just to fill in that gap. And he went, yeah, sure. All of this was part time for me. At that time, I was doing a computer course at uh, Dundee Institute of Technology, which later became Abertee. You know, time passed and, you know, that game got finished. And after converting Shadow the Beast and Ballistics, which was earlier, uh, I then got the offer of doing uh, Ballistics for the, now what was it, the, the PC engine? Which had, you know, more colours, you know, more graphics, and that was fine. And that was the, the first time I, I did some original graphics, you know, with the ships that span round as well. So after that was done, you know, Dave seemed very happy with that. And, you know, one day I went into the office and easiest job interview I will ever have in my life, Dave said, no, well, Steve, do you fancy a job? And I went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was a DMA, yeah. Well, have you played the uh, recent reboot of Shadow of the Beast for the PS4? And uh, what uh, do you think? No, I haven't. If you're... You haven't? Ah. I, I've seen it. It looks nice, but I haven't played <laughs> it. It looks very nice. See, that was the thing that uh, at DMA, we, we did get very snippy about Psygnosis. You know, like, you know, we have the gameplay, Psygnosis has the, you know, the pretty pictures, but not the gameplay. How fair that is, I, I don't honestly know, but we, we did have a bit of an attitude about that. <laughs> well, I was going to ask that because obviously DMA and Psygnosis had a very close relationship, but what was the, the working partnership really like between the company? Fractious. It was fractious. Um, I don't think it was in the best place to see the the detailed machinations of, you know, all the deals that were going on. But, you know, from from what I heard by, you know, wandering into the main office and, you know, talking to people, Psygnosis dilly-dallied a lot. Uh, they got behind on payments, you know, to us, you know, a, a few times. But personally, uh, I think <laughs> I think my opinion of Psygnosis was cemented with uh, the Hired Guns Manual. I was writing the Hired Guns Manual, and this was... You know, the best thing I'd, I'd ever done it was, you know, I was coming up with the characters, the story, the background, you know, like, you know, I'm making up the whole world. Because you know, in those days, uh, you, you can't get the background, you know, through the game itself. There just wasn't enough room, you know, with, you know, these days, you know, tutorials and you have cut scenes and, you know, all sorts of marvellous ways of conveying storytelling and background information. But back then, all had to go in a booklet. So, I don't know several book, booklets worth of text and I actually typeset most of it but Psygnosis suddenly went ah right we need this in a couple of weeks time you know sort of urgent deadline urgent deadline send us all you've got kind of thing so okay it was finished you know the text was finished so gathered it all up you know sent it off uh, Scott Johnson who was the programmer in the well it's his project basically he wrote some notes for the actual the controls, you know, how, how you played it, you know, I supplied the background, he supplied the control information, the instructions. Yeah. So sent off to Psygnosis, you know, this, this urgent thing, and then 11 months passed, not terribly urgent, and 11 months passed, and then the game's out. And he hadn't said anything to us, got a complimentary copy, and, you know, we're in the office, and all right, here's, here's high guns, you know, the fines to do. So open the box, you know, Scott grabbed one of the mines, I grabbed another booklet, and opened it, and it's like, the... You know, the, the whole thing I'd done, there was no apostrophes, no commas, no full stops, just no punctuation. Okay, great. Uh, Scott was looking, you know, even even worse. You know, his instruction booklets, they'd, they'd taken his notes, copied and pasted them. They hadn't rewritten them. It was, it was a nightmare. It was a complete disaster. So no commas, no full stops, nothing? No, no. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm told that it got fixed in a subsequent edition, but this was uh, like a few months before Christmas. Yeah, <laughs> I just ah. That's a bit of an oversight, isn't it? <laughs> Quality so control. Yeah. yeah, they blamed it on a third party, mm. you know, a, a publisher, you know, typesetter. So, you know, I, I don't know what happened there, but. <laughs> well, I guess at that time, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I guess DMA and Psygnosis kind of needed each other at that stage, though. Yes, I, I think you're right. Uh, I think they famously said that he chose Psygnosis because they were closest. You know, you know, literally, you know, that's about as much as he'd want to put into a drive anyway. <laughs> well, let's get back to your early days at DMA. I mean, when you first started there, what, what were the initial, like, first games that you were working on? Oh, good question. Uh, let's see. I did I did a lot of level design for the original Lemmings, mm. none of which levels actually made it into the game. But my face is in the, the, the final screen, so that, that was a bit of a... <laughs> 
I, lo- I love that ending screen. <laughs> the, the ending screen, yeah. yeah. My levels uh, turned out was either too easy or too difficult. Okay. So. <laughs> that, that nice bit in the middle. I, I managed to get levels into Lightning 2, so that was so that was good. But no, I spent uh, a lot of the early time doing um, you know PR kind of stuff, you know, making up documents about the games. Well, obviously, I mean, Lemmings was kind of based on um, Mike Daly's animation, wasn't it? That little animation that we all saw. Do you, do you remember when you first saw that then and what was kind of your, your reaction to it? I thought it was fun. But it's interesting, you know, this thing where there's, uh, you know, an amazing origin for the game. And Lemmings, Lemmings actually fits that bill. You know, there, there was uh, this, a moment that, uh, I mean, and I didn't see this moment. But I heard about it endlessly afterwards, you know. Mike did this animation. Uh, Biscuit thought, uh, Biscuit Brian Watson, you know, he's another one of the guys from the, you know, the Kingsway Computer Club. He just about fell off his seat laughing at it. Russell said, yeah, there's a game in that. And Dave agreed. Dave remembers that differently. He remembers it as he thought there was a game in there. But as far as me and Mike and Russell are concerned, it was Russell said, yeah, there's a game a game in that. Somebody wants the credit. <laughs> Somebody does, yes. Well, that game went to sell over 20 million copies in total. Did that kind of shock you all? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, a, none, as far as I'm concerned, none of it felt out of the ordinary or special or... I, 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 don't, know how to, I don't know how to explain it. It's just, you know, whatever happens to you when you, when you grow up is normal. Making games with your friends just felt normal, so... Well, it, it was, I guess, you know, then it was kind of pre-internet and, like, the only thing you really... I mean, t- to try and get an image of just how big your game is outside of your development studio, I guess the magazines obviously were going wild about the game, but it must have been... Yeah, did it feel yeah. a bit like you were in a bubble and you didn't really know quite how big the game was? Well, yes, yeah, that's it. There, there was nothing to really compare ourselves to. You know, there was no other teams or devs that we knew, certainly not in Dundee and... You know, all, all the ones that we heard about in the you know the magazines were were distant. You know, we, we knew them, or knew some of them by reputation, and some of them were very tight lipped about what they were doing. Uh, all Ultima play the game were, uh, I think, quite famously reticent to see anything at all. And, and Dave actually took inspiration from that. You know, we, we went through a period with uh, just talking to magazines, talking to magazines, and then Dave went, "We're not doing that anymore. We're going to be mysterious." Well, um. You must have kind of noticed it becoming part of popular culture because it was getting ported to so many systems. Like It was everything from the Commodore 64 to the 3DO it was on, the CDI. Yeah. And, I mean, even talking about it being part of popular culture, I mean, obviously we had the, the bronze lemming statues being unveiled in Dundee a couple of years ago as well. Which... Yeah, yeah, but it took all that time to, to build up. Mm-hmm. Although, I think in retrospect, uh, when I started to realise that, yeah, maybe something special was going on, uh, I know this was uh, in college, you know, I was just in one of the computer rooms and I got to the you know, latest Amiga magazine, opened the page and there's an article about DMA and there's a picture of me and the rest of the team. <laughs> it's, you know, I had no idea that was going to happen. I mean, you know, we talked about the different ports there and I, one that I always yeah. thought was technically a real marvel was the Commodore 64 port of Lemmings. I don't think it was us that did that. Because it came out later, didn't it? It was a couple of years later, I think. Yeah, uh, it's one one of those things where, uh, you know, it was third parties, you know, tended to do all the conversions. Uh, Mike did the SNES version, though. That was in-house. But uh, I, do, I do remember Dave was getting really bored of the whole thing with Lemmings. Mm. You know, he just wanted to see the end of it because he wanted to move on. You know, so it was, a, it was a big success and it made our name, certainly. But, you know, Dave, it was like, yeah, OK, done that. Wanted to move on, but, of course, Signals just wanted sequels. Lemmings on the snares, you mentioned that. you could. Act- well, there was a rumour that you could actually play that with a super scope. You can. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> yes, wow. can. I, I have got that confirmed from Mike personally. Yes, you can do that. That's amazing. I, I need to get one now. <laughs> <laughs> How important was Deluxe Paint and uh, similar packages to your kind of development? That's incredibly important, incredibly important. Um, I, I, I don't know if we could have done it without it. You know, the Amiga was the graphics machine, and it was a graphics machine because it had deluxe paint in it. Uh, you know, until 3D rendering came along, which needed more powerful machines, you know, D-paint was everywhere. Must have been um, stuff like anim brushes and stuff must have just brushes, saved yeah. time so quickly. But I have to give a, a special uh, shout-out to 3-in-1, which was Tony Crowther's graphic programme for the Commodore 64. You know, th- this was... Uh, 
Well, like that was what I used to do the conversion for Shadow of the Beast and all the rest of it. And, you know, Mike used that as well. And that was, I, if not the deep end of its day, it was certainly as invaluable at that time. Lemmings 2, working on that, it must have been a hard task to kind of match or live up to the reputation of the original. Yeah, no, sorry. I mean, I, I did think it took away um, some of what made it special, mm. which was just, you know, the sheer number of lemmings you could fit on a screen. A, a thing I loved about that game as well was yeah. the, the kind of fact that each one did have a different tribe and there was a different kind of music. Were, were you part of the Scottish tribe at all? <laughs> I suppose I was. I suppose I was. <laughs> did you have a favourite, though, of the tribes? I, I like to I like the space lemmings, yeah. but then I like space Lego. I like space anything, so I, it was definitely a science fiction. Well, well, for me, that was one of the only games for the Amiga that I bought legally, <laughs> and that was because <laughs> it had such a kind of good package with it and a, and a background. It came with a little chapter book that explained all the tribes, and it kind of it just felt like such a bigger game. You know, you weren't just yeah. completing yeah. levels with much more. Uh, higher skill set. You were you were doing different challenges, and there was a lot yeah. more moves yeah. and abilities. Yeah, I, I think it was felt uh, afterwards that uh, you know I had kind of moved away from the the simplicity of the original concept. Yeah, no, there is kind of a split camp. Some people love like the original simple yeah. lemmings, but yeah. you know, I, I'm kind of with Ravi as well. Or I kind of. I did enjoy trying. I mean, I'd go on the practice level sometimes and just kind of, you know, you could pick your own kind of lemmings and your tools and stuff and just yeah. play around with them and see what they do was always fun. And I also found the intro was really good. Um, like, you know, the original intro with them jumping out of the boot balloons, this one with the uh, wise old lemming telling tales. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was one of Dave's points, actually. You know, you're saying about you're just picking it up and playing with it, is that, you know, a good game was a toy. It didn't force you into, you know, playing with it in a particular way. It was something you could just mess about with. Hmm. You know, if you wanted to not bother, you know, completing the level, just make them all explode just, just for the fun of it. So, yeah, so that was that was one of the philosophies, uh, I think, you know, with, uh, with gameplay being a toy as well as a game. Even to this day, I still get satisfaction out of nuking lemmings and just watching them blow <laughs> yeah, down the yeah. screen. <laughs> um, there was a big, uh, not even a big thing, but there was a, a thing with uh, with Japan. It was it was very frowned upon for you know, a character to commit suicide, and that's what a lemming amounted to. Oh, actually, well, I remember there was a, and, and this never actually happened, but at one point there was going to be a special children's version of Lemmings for the children's television workshop. You know, the basically Sesame Street Lemmings. Oh wow! Unfortunately, I don't have the the document, but I've got a fraction of it that I've got in the newsletter, one of the newsletters, that said that, you know, basically a whole list of changes, you know, no gore and... Uh, I'll have to dig that out. <laughs> so was I'll it, have was, to dig that out for the Play Expo. Cause, yeah. <laughs> was it going to be what, like half a, t- a, story. a TV show kind of thing then, was it? Yes, yes. Wow. Um, uh, myself and Gary Timmons actually came up with uh, an amount of background, you know, for uh, a Saturday morning cartoon. Wow. At one point, you know, again, that well, obviously that didn't go anywhere. There isn't a cartoon, but but it, it was a possibility for for a wee while. I, I thought it, it might have been a bit like you know. It reminds me of Fraggle Rock. You know, the dozers on that. They could have been a bit like yeah. they were a bit like lemmings, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but hey, if you've, if you've seen the, the Minions movie, tell me, Sony has the the rights to lemmings these days. How come Sony Entertainment is not making a lemmings movie? like minions oh no that that would be great do you remember yeah. the um promo tune that they did for lemmings too it was kind of like a klf style uh, a rap about lemmings oh is, is that really the music video yeah yeah well oh, crumbs yeah i i watched that on youtube just recently <laughs> and it stuck in my head for a whole week so that needs a real a re-release <laughs> Well, speaking of things we've seen on YouTube, we were actually watching this this afternoon. There is a video of like a, a tour of DMA, and I think you're like the cameraman or something in it as well. I'm the camera, cameraman, yes. I, I filmed that in 1992. I got it in at the computer. I gave a copy to Mike. Mike put it on YouTube without asking me, and now it's everywhere. <laughs> well, I'm going to put that in this week's show notes, just in case people haven't seen it. But, I mean, looking <laughs> yeah. at it, did that kind of sum up the vibe of DMA? It just looks like you're all having such a laugh. Well, that was, I think, a few weeks before Christmas, and you'll notice that everybody's reading a wee newsletter. That was the Christmas parody newsletter, which I wrote. And what makes it weirder for being a parody newsletter is I also wrote the newsletter. So, <laughs> yeah, go figure that one. Well, you didn't get them confused. Send the wrong one out. <laughs> <laughs> 
But I mean, was it kind of like, you know, what was the vibe like at DMA? Was there much partying going on? I mean, you're all young guys and stuff. What, what was it like? It, it was fun. Um, I, I think it was certainly more fun up until about, you know, 30, 30, 30 people. Hmm. Can you think? Uh, we had, uh, it was in the middle floor of Discovery House, you know, sort of various offices, Dave had an office. We had the design department, which I was part of. And yeah, it was it was quite close knit at times, and it was a very relaxed atmosphere. I mean, certainly with the design department, you're know, just having hour long conversations about games. There was no pressure, no crunch. I do think the situation was different in later years uh, when we had you know distinct teams. Hmm. Uh, you, you know, we ended up with two buildings. The other one was open plan, and that was where GTA was getting made and I, I think the atmosphere kind of changed after a while it, it, it was very much you know me and my friends you know just us you know having a having a great time kind of thing whilst making games but then it got kind of serious and you know there were you know there were some divisions you know in the you know the mid to late 90s I mean certainly there was a <laughs> there was a, a faction within DMA that did not like the design department one bit hmm. You know, calling this Dave's pet department, you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, I guess it happens in any teams when the the bigger and you know bigger and bigger and people from the outside come in and yeah. I noticed the DMA logo started changing quite a lot over those times. So, like when it was <laughs> on yellow uh, Lemmings Two, it was like the kind of cliff, like three D a bit. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, a bit three D, and then it all kind of started getting a bit more corporate. Didn't it? Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. was uh, yeah, that one you mentioned. That was Scott Johnson's logo. I, I don't think we took the seriousness of being a business very serious, if, if you see what I mean, because um, Scott was a, a great one for experimenting with, you know, graphics and uh, oh, now what was it? There was a, a landscape rendering program that he got for the Amiga, played about with it and, and one day he came up with a, a DMA logo and said, oh, hey, that looks good. And that became our logo. And I mean, I think, you know, for me, one of my favourite eras of DMA was, and you know, it's one of my favourite Amiga games full stop, was Hired Guns. I am Love so that. glad you said that. All right. <laughs> I, I remember getting the, there was a demo, I think, on Amiga format uh, a few yeah, months before it came remember. out. And we just, my brother and I, we just played that nonce. Must have played it for about like 12 hours a day till the game came out. And I mean, is that a game you're fond of? And what was kind of the, how, how did that game come around then? What, where did the idea come from? Ah, am I fond of fired guns? Yes, that's an understatement. I'm very fond of that. Uh, Signosis aside, as I mentioned earlier. Um, yes, uh, Scott jo- Scott Johnson uh, came in as a graphic artist uh, quite early on. And he was working on a game, uh, Walker, you know, doing the you know the Walker animations. A oh, fantastic uh, game, that one. Yeah, really yeah, yeah. It's, it's very underrated. And it transpired that uh, in his spare time, you know, he was doing a a dungeon master kind of game, and you know, you know, yeah, it was called Three D Game. That that was its original title, Three D Game. So you know, Dave got wind of this, and eventually that became an official DMA project. But that was that was a fantasy game to begin with. Mm. I mean, it was a pure fantasy game. You you might notice that uh, all the monsters are fantasy monsters. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there was a point now Scott remembers this differently from what I do I remember having a conversation with him you know and saying well you know why why don't we make it a science fiction game a science fiction game and you know, my reasoning was that well every dungeon crawler is exactly that it's a, a dungeon crawler it's a mm-hmm. fantasy game there's no science fiction games out there and the other reason is I, I like science fiction you know so yeah, he, he, he agreed with that, but I kind of I kind of suspect that he'd already decided that because he was a big fan of Aliens, and he so much wanted to get those auto, or, you know, those automatic turrets. Yeah. Into her guns, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> bam, 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 bam at the corner. So he has to be a science fiction game. So that's why uh, <laughs> in the manual of kind of instead of being fantasy creatures, they are you know sort of bioengineered creatures you know just designed for the battlefield you know it's, it's, it's retconned essentially but i, I kind of I, I was kind of chuffed with that well what were the characters kind of based on anything then the characters uh i oh yeah i came up with uh, a dozen characters you know that was you know we needed a dozen characters so i came up with a you know a dozen you know just i, I think it's quite diverse in, in retrospect you know there was 
you know, women cyborgs and men, robots, you know, a nice mix kind of thing. And the great thing about Scott is that he gave me a completely free hand in how he came up with the background and how he came up with the story and all, all the rest of it. Uh, it was inspired by, uh, I don't know if you know, Ian Banks' novel Consider Phlebas. Basically, that was a book about space mercenaries, essentially. So I thought, mm, mercenaries, what, what would mercenaries be like? You know, I came up with just, you know, a set of characters. Uh, came up with a background for them, you know, a, a wee potted bio, and that kind of kind of thing. Part of the background, there's a big story arc, which you see a fraction of in the game itself, and even in the manual itself, you know. Uh, one of the characters, Sherelle, so she was going to be the main character, she was from Earth, everyone else was from this system, and had, you know, this this big story about that, and she was the, the protagonist. She was going to be black, originally. At that time, you know, a 2000 AD spin-off was a crisis, which was a, a more grown-up, sort of more politically aware comic, and there was a, a strip called Third World, Third World War, which had a main character called Eve, who was, you know, a black female protagonist, and, and I, I really liked that, and I thought, okay, I could do something like that. And this is where the, the urgent deadline for the manual uh, messed things up again. Described all these characters to our illustrator, who I am not going to name, you know, to do, uh, you know, a set of 12 headshots or, you know, pictures. I thought, well, you know, one of them could be, you know, like a CCTV image, another one could be a passport, you know, just you know, variations on that. I described what the characters like, gave them the notes. And he went away, uh, came back and, you know, did them all entirely differently to what I'd said. He just, and he admitted to me, he just, yeah, I just came up with a bunch of, bunch of characters which are completely at odds with what I'd written. So, oh, we've got to get this, uh, you know, manual off in two weeks. So, oh, no, no, oh, no, oh, no, right. So, this bio can go with that illustration, this bio can go with that illustration. And so on. And Shoel became this, this blonde. So, <laughs> how weird. How, how weird. But, you know, what really gets me is, you know, this was 1992. Hmm. You know, 1982, uh, a computer game with a black female protagonist. Now, I think if we had managed that, that would have been a world first. Yeah, I mean, everyone talks about Tomb Raider as being like the first female lead, but, you know, that yeah, was like four, yeah. four years before, yeah. Yeah, if, if, if that had come off, that would have been my crowning achievement in this lifetime, you know. <laughs> Some guy changed it. <laughs> Some guy changed it, yeah. Well, everybody kind of forgets about those dungeon crawlers as well. They always talk about the early FPSs, but they kind of forget about those that genre of dungeon crawlers and they had yeah, a yeah. great unique atmosphere and pace to them. I always remember high guns, you know, you'd hear like the the sound of like twigs cracking and like, you know, it, it was <laughs> terrifying. And when you got to the water <laughs> bits and, oh, it was a very atmospheric game. Yeah, but it, it broke even. It, it didn't make a profit. And I think there was two reasons for that. And one, if you were going to buy an Amiga game that Christmas, Pirate Guns, well reviewed. Um, and the other thing that had been in development nine years, I was just about to come out, Elite Frontier 2. Yeah. So what, what were you going to buy? That was a bit unfortunate timing, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, unfortunate timing. And the other unfortunate timing, uh, that was when uh, <laughs> Doom started grabbing all the press. Yeah, I suppose it was. What was that, 93, was it? Uh, nine, that was, yeah, late yeah. 93. So, yeah, Elite come out, Doom comes out, and it's like, pff, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're going to get up against big games, I think you're kind of yeah, up against the biggest there, aren't you, I guess? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I remember with high guns, I mean, talking about attention to detail, even the fact that, like, you know, the, the robotic players could breathe underwater and the humans couldn't. Stuff like that. <laughs> it was just that attention to detail and every character had its own unique strengths. Which, yeah, you know, did a lot yeah. of thought kind of go into that? Oh, a huge amount of thought. Absolutely huge amount. Um, the, the game was delayed, Although I think it's more honest to say that the game never had a, a set deadline. Uh, <laughs> you know, because back in those days, uh, development of a, a project was kind of uh, what you might call organic. So, you know, Scott, I think, did most of the donkey work at home. You know, he just, you know, backed it all up, took it home, did a lot of work on it into the you know, wee small hours, transferred it again into work and, you know, carried on. So he put a huge amount of effort into it and he you know, did a lot of thinking about it. Well, some of the enemies were a bit tongue-in-cheek. You even had lemmings making an appearance. <laughs> with, with a lot of in-jokes or Easter eggs in there uh, uh, at the time. There were, and yes, I, I don't have a canonical explanation for any of them. <laughs> but the, the, the puppies, yeah. Yeah. The deadliest threat. I love the way that a banana was like the most powerful weapon in the game as well. <laughs> that was always a bit ironic. I don't know where that came from. But, uh... 
but it was a fantastic game and I mean like yeah. like I said as, as a kid like you know I, I was about what 11 when that came out and I remember playing it though and we just mesmerized by it it was such an interesting just an atmospheric game just transport you to a different world there was talk of a CD32 version of, uh, of uh, higher guns as well but never yes. saw the light of day how, how far yeah. along was that uh, Scott left uh, DMA to work for Mike Reports, I think it was. So he carried on with, uh, you know, the CD32 version in his spare time, um, you know, updating 256 colour graphics, uh, you know, some intro sequence stuff. He got quite far along with it. And I don't know why he stopped. I think, you know, the CD32 just wasn't... So, you know, the Amiga was on the way out to, at that point, unfortunately. Hmm. But... Uh, uh, now, it was 1998, and he got in touch with me and basically said, you know, he didn't have an Amiga anymore, you know, not, not at all. But he did have the the hard drive that all the source code and assets were on, and he sent me that up. So I have a copy of the CD32 version. And I have been so tempted to release that, but I don't know how, because, you know, I don't want to get into trouble because it is still theoretically owned by Sony, you know, the hard guns IP. So, well, well, there is actually a group on on the internet that they, they do unofficial CD32 releases. Oh yeah, uh, maybe we should put you in touch with those guys because they yeah, they've yeah. done a lot of kind of compilations for the CD32. Yeah, it didn't and, um... come from me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's other copies of it out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's some. I mean, so have you looked through this then? And is, is it like, is it much different to the original version then, from what you see? It's it's not vastly different. It's it's improvement in quality. Hmm. You know. Um, more sound effects, uh, improved graphics. I, 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 I've not seen any fundamental changes to the gameplay. But the, the good news on, on that front, if it does see the light day in some way, is that it comes complete with a, a level editor. Oh wow, nice. Yes. So, yeah, it would be it would be nice to nice to see that. I'm sure if Ravi got hold of a copy and uh, it accidentally got leaked, you know, he'd take the blame. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa. Uh, back, back. So, um, was there also a planned Hide Gwen sequel at all? <laughs> yes. Um, well, there, there's several answers to that. Um, for a while, me and Scott planned the Hide Guns to just, you know, even, even before, you know, the first one was released, you know, this was... Uh, we were both into Celtic mythology at that point, and it was going to be something along those lines, which never saw the light of day. Once Scott left, um, we, we did throw ideas around. Uh, I think the rest of us for Hired Guns 2, although those ideas basically never had anything in common with being a dungeon crawler. Ah, now, this would have been 96? 96, yeah, and, you know, so I'm sitting in the design department, you know, Dave Jones you know, comes up and says, so, OK, Steve, how would you like to remake had guns. Not a sequel, a remake. And this would have been using the Unreal Engine. So, well, that sounds good. That sounds great, in fact. Um, that almost sounds like it's my project. So, well, great, I'll start doing the design document. Uh, <laughs> yes, so... So then DNA got bought by Gremlin Graphics. And this created a, a bit of a problem. Because their publisher, Psygnosis, is a different publisher. So... The project couldn't continue. Well, it could because DMA had a US branch, uh, DMA US in uh, Boulder, Colorado. So, however, the business was working, uh, the, the DMA US branch was going to become its own studio, uh, Devil's Thumb Entertainment. So, they got a selection of the projects. DMA in the UK got a selection of projects, and Hired Guns, the remake, the Unreal version, moved to. DMA US. Now, this meant either I could not work on it anymore, and remember, this is my ultimate project of all time, hmm. sort of thing, the thing I'm most fond of, so I couldn't work on it anymore, or I could, but I'd have to go freelance, and I chose to go freelance and work on it, and then after, uh, was it three months, four months, well, it was after, after a, you know, a short while, they decided that they weren't using third parties anymore. No and I was way. off the project and basically out, out of the game industry entirely. How unlucky. It, yeah. it was a tad unlucky, yes. Oh, <laughs> so how, how far along was the game like development then? Did you get much done on it in that time? Um, I, well, I mean, I, I did all my work on the, you know, the story background, you know, all that kind of stuff. But there is a complete, an almost complete version that got leaked. Now, there was... 
I'm not quite sure in the story. That's one of the stories that I've heard. The other one is that it did actually get released in Germany, but I I, I don't know how to do any of that is. Yeah, you think so it'd be a bit more widespread if it got a proper release, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Have you still got a copy of it then? Do I? Um, maybe I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you. okay. I I found an ISO <laughs> about ten years ago. Oh wow! And it's and it's still not. I still have not had the nerve to actually try and install it. That's something I, that... The f- I, I don't want to see what they've done to my characters. <laughs> that is understandable. How, 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 how up myself is that? <laughs> well, um, DMA also worked with Nintendo too. Um, how did that come about and uh, how was it? Yes, uh, this was one of those uh, computer shows, uh, the CES or the E3. I can't remember which one. But basically to show off, uh, we had... Nintendo believed that you couldn't play back full motion video from a, a SNES cartridge. So we went ahead and proved that, yes, we can play back full motion video from a SNES cartridge. Um, I think it was Andy White who worked on the compression, and uh, and it was a clip from Star Wars that we put into this cartridge, and Dave took it along to the show and basically used it to impress Nintendo, and Nintendo were actually impressed, and they went, great, um, we should work together. So, you know, that's where the... The relationship started, and, and that was great <laughs> until Body Harvest came along, of course. But uh, <laughs> but that's another hour's worth of talking. Did you get to meet Miyamoto? I think so. Yeah, I had a rumor that he came to uh, DMA's offices. Oh, well, he definitely came through. He definitely came through. Um, there's the two stories. Uh, the the one I was involved in, which was not very interesting, and Dave taking. Miyamoto out in his Ferrari. Dave's got a big shiny red Ferrari at that point. And yeah, Dave's sense of humour, as he was telling it, you know, afterwards, you know, he, he's driving around in the five countryside and, you know, Shigeru in the pa- passenger seat. And there's, you know, a bus full of school kids and he passes out and all the kids are going waving, wow, 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 hey, wow, hey, and, and making a big fuss. And Dave said, that's because they know you. And that was rubbish. It was because it was a shiny Ferrari. <laughs> no, no. See, it's it's hard to conceive of people not knowing who he is. But you know, back then, I, I certainly didn't know who he was. You know, or or his reputation. The general public, not a chance. But I think I met him because there was a group from Nintendo came along, and uh, we we got encouraged to dress up nicely for that day. So, of course, uh, that day comes along and I've got a huge, huge cold and I, oh, I can't go in, but uh, meet Nintendo, must meet Nintendo. And there was a prize of a Kit Kat for whoever had the most improved appearance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this was Simon Little, you know, one of the, uh, you know, the managers. So, you know, he ran a talk shop within DMA. Um, yeah, I won. Most so, improved uh, appearances. So is that like whoever looks the worst looks the best that day? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Fine, <laughs> fine detail. Yes, I go to that one. but you know, so this was the whole day. I'm feeling terrible, and then you know, oh, the, the, the Japanese are here, and nothing happens. Nothing happens, and then the, the, the door to the design department opens, and you know, Dave's there and three guys who look around for you know, they don't walk around. They just look around for 15 seconds ago. Okay, right. And away again. So 15 seconds, I think. I met, I met Miyamoto. <laughs> and you probably made a good impression on that day. I you made a good impression because I didn't see anything. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it was such an, an impressive company, you know, in terms of all the stuff that you put out there. And obviously, you know, we're talking, getting into the late 90s now. And uh, we need to talk a bit about Grand Theft Auto, um, probably the biggest video game franchise ever now. I mean, did you have much involvement in GTA before you left? I had some involvement. Um, in the design department, we basically uh, we, we basically turned over, you know, ideas that came through. And I was saying earlier about, you know, that this idea that, you know, a game has, you know, a magic moment of creation, which was true for Lemmings. It was not true for GTA. Uh, GTA began in various different threads. Uh, Mike, just experimenting with technology, you know, created a, you know, a 3D isometric engine. Uh, there was a need at that time to move into PC development, you know, developing for a console, like you know, the SNES or the, the Ultra 64 uh, 
to me, it's the Auto 64, not the Nintendo 64. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, it's project reality for most of the time. And, you know, and, and that cost you know, money to, to develop for it, but a PC, anyone who could develop for it. And... GTA started basically as, uh, and, and I've got this in the newsletter, uh, February 1995, new PC project, and that was the very first mention of what it was going to become, and it was literally just a uh, need an ID for a PC game. So there was I mean, Dave is a big car nut, you know, he's he's into sports cars, so there, there was you know car games were in the air. You know, earlier there was a short-lived project called 4x4, which was, you know, a, a car racing game, and that was a development of an earlier, you know, car game of various things. So, you know, there's all these ideas just floating around that, get, that kind of came together at one point. So, I mean, my involvement was really in early discussions, you know, in the design department, sort of, you know, ideas for games, this, that, next thing, what do you think of this, we could do all that. And... I don't remember the content because it wasn't anything special. It was just it was just another game, you know. Just well, you know, it's a card game. Not unusual about that. So uh, Keith uh, Hamilton, you know, went away and you know wrote up the the first design document, which uh, Mike's you know uh, put on his Flickr page. Um, it was still called Race and Chase at that time, and you know my name's in the, in the first paragraph, which I'm really proud of. But that that was my, my, my only involvement um, for quite some time. Um, other than that, you know, just, you know, versions would come through and I'd play test them and they were unremittingly awful. They just, yeah, I could not get into it. Uh, yeah, and after a while, uh, once things had started to gel and once it was starting to get good, you know, there were more discussions. Uh, you know, Brian Baglow, you know, came in. Uh, to DMA and you know he he was involved in doing you know some writing for that mm. and you know and, and we would have uh, uh, you know meetings just ourselves you know having this this, this great old chat because me and Brian you know just share a sense of humour you know this this kind of ridiculous satirical um, did you ever watch the day to day yeah yeah, yeah. Course, hilarious yeah. he loved that you know just 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 that kind of sur- surreality and and there you go again you know the, the, this British surreal humour that just goes through. Games, you know, way back. So, you know, you know, we throw, you know, about ideas, and I think, you know, some of them might have stuck. You know, some of them just sort of seeped in. Um, my most solid involvement was uh, Gary Penn asked me to do a dialogue rewrite hmm. on some of the pagers. You know, like in, in the game, you know, you'd have, uh, you know, a couple of lines of pager statements, and yeah. you know, just just do a dialogue polish. You know, just sort of make it a bit nicer and that sort of thing. So I got all these pages. Uh, things and you know I, I took them home you know because I, I find I can only really write away from the office and you know I just I just went through them did it under that, uh, going slowly crazy as I got to the end and took them to Gary after you know three months and you know and he literally read them all right in front of me as I'm standing there just going through them going through them all these pages yeah 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 and at the end I'm like Oh, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And he's like, "Yeah, that's all very entertaining, but they're too big." I, I, I don't know how much of uh, my stuff actually remained in GT. I'm convinced that the character that's called Deaver, that that was the name I came up with. Well, I mean, you know, even just being there in the early days of what oh, yeah. eventually became the biggest, I mean, it's biggest entertainment franchise ever, isn't it? GTA Five outsold Hollywood movies and every other video game. It's like, it must be nuts to know that you kind of helped sow the seeds of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think that I, I didn't have a big influence. Mm. I, mean, I had a microscopic influence, but yeah, butterfly effect. Maybe you know it might have been something very different. And and to be honest, when I looked at GTA when it came out on the PC, I thought this was quite far behind in the graphics compared to what it was. But the gameplay just totally took it into a next direction. So. Yeah, I mean, people call the. Uh, or called, you know, the, the graphics cartoonish. And that was intentional. Yeah, it's that arcadey feel, wasn't it? You know? It was, um, I, mean, I, re- I remember at the time, you know, I think I came up with a wee example that I printed out, you know, about colour palettes, and there was uh, the Unreal, there was Doom, and, you know, uh, no, it was Quake at that point. You know, just, you know, three, four screenshots, whatever it was, and it was like, quick, which game's which? They all look the same. They all all this, yeah. this muddy grey yeah. brown sort of thing, and Stuart Graham was, 
you know, he was the head of the design department. He was very keen on making it look different, look bright. I you think know, that, was, so that was a good shout, though. It was a good shout because, it, you know, you can look at a screenshot from that game and instantly recognise it. But yeah. like you said, between Mist and Quake and all that, you're like, it could be any of them really, couldn't it? But also, <laughs> it, it was kind of like the Brits' take on American culture, you know, having the big American school buses in there and it was all, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very tongue-in-cheek. Well, Steve, it's been amazing reminiscing with you. Well, I hope it makes sense. Absolutely. Well, what, what are you doing these days? Well, uh, after the games industry, I mean, uh, I worked in aerospace for 15 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> Quite the change. <laughs> quite, quite, quite the change, you know. I, I was writing instrument control software, and it was just, yeah, circumstances. Uh, I think what what gave me itchy feet was it was the Lemmings twentieth anniversary. Okay, so I'm um, oh, Lemmings twentieth anniversary, right? Oh, crumbs, games. I used to do that sort of stuff, and then all the other anniversaries came along. All the other anniversaries of 20 years. God, have I been away from this for 20 years? I, I mean, I've not got a burning desire to make games, but I do have a burning desire to write. So, you know, I was about to move in with my girlfriend and that uh, that made the commute to work kind of logistically nightmarish. I could quit and become a freelance writer. You know, it's what I always wanted to do. You know, so I did, you know, and that's been three years three years now, so I've been working on a history of DMA. I've, I've just recently finished, or exhausted all my recollections into this thing. I've been going through the newsletters. Now I've started saying, okay, Mike, Russell, so do you want to uh, answer some questions? You know, just fill in the gaps and, you know, hopefully, I mean, this is a years-long project, but hopefully I will have a complete history of DMA design, you know, from the from the inside. Oh, wow. Wow. So when's, what's like the time frame for that then? Do you, is that you for <laughs> when, when it's done? When it's done, yeah. When it's done, though, we'll all buy a copy. It sounds yeah. fantastic. Will that be Kickstarter then, or have you not planned um, it? No, it's possible. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's only one one project. Uh, you know, I'm writing a science fiction novel, you know, also just about the first draft. Um, I, ha- I have written, I completed a, uh, an audio drama script for a political thriller, which was a bit of a diversion. Um, there's a comic, uh, Archangel, not, not the William Gibson one. I have to, I have to emphasise. This is a, another one, uh, which uh, I wrote the, the script for. So that hopefully should be out uh, uh, sometime next year. Or, sorry, sometime this year. That passion for writing that started on Shadow of the Beast on the C64, you finally Beast, fulfilled yeah. it. But possibly of most interest uh, to you guys is uh, Inviolate. Hmm. Now this this is an indie game. Uh, G Void Games. Um, I, I think you'll find them on uh, Twitter, someplace. Uh, it's basically, uh, you know, these guys in London who are writing. It's it's a science fiction cyberpunk dungeon crawler, directly inspired by handguns. Oh wow! Oh nice. So, uh, you know, so uh, you know, the, the guy got in touch with me uh, about a year and a bit ago, and said, "Well, do, do you want to write the, the story for this?" And actually wanted to make me a selling point. I've got, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> So is that out yet then, or is it coming out soon? Or? It's um, the the short story version, which is you know a demo version, is I think it's functionally complete, um, and they're putting together uh, a video uh, for a Kickstarter. I I, I don't know how long, uh, hopefully a few months, but uh, but when that comes out, uh, I'll be sure to. Well, we should tell you. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Send us a link. We'll promote it loads. Yeah, yeah. we'd love to. <laughs> so that, that's my life, you know, is uh, well, various writing projects and, you know, one of them will, <laughs> one of them will pay off one day. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, honestly, it's been so interesting getting the that's stories good. behind some of our favourite games ever. It's, you know, been wonderful to talk to you, Steve. Thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> OK. Obviously, we'll be seeing you at Play Expo next month. I'm feeling a lot more relaxed about that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so if people want to come along and meet Steve and you know find out more of these memories, we're all going to be there at Play Expo in Blackpool on the uh, 10th and 11th coming up next month. So uh, we're looking forward to that, Steve. Can't wait to meet you in person. Then, then.